that. Okay, hello and welcome everybody. My name is Rachel Carey and I'm a technical writer here at Smartling. I'm joining you today from Dublin and I hope you're well wherever you are joining us from. Firstly, I wanna thank you all for taking the time to join us today to discuss the highly topical developing and deploying a multilingual COVID-19 glossary. I'm honored and delighted to introduce to you our guest today. Joining us from Sydney, Associate Professor Holly Seal of the School of Population Health at the University of New South Wales, Australia. Holly is an infectious diseases social scientist at the School of Population Health at UNSW. And she has over 15 years in undertaking social science research with a particular focus on improving the confidence and engagement of different at-risk groups with immunization and other prevention strategies. Today, we'll explore one of our latest endeavors, the development and deployment of a multilingual COVID-19 glossary. Welcome, Holly, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the opportunity to, to present. Great to have you. Now, before we dive into the glossary, I'd just like to give you a brief overview of Smartling and who we are. Smartling is a translation company, and our mission is to translate and localize the world's digital content. And this couldn't be more important than right now in today's world, because all of that content that's created for health education purposes or for product enablement purposes or marketing purposes, it all has to be translated and accessible globally. And so for the last nearly 12 years now, we've been working with over a thousand customers all over the globe to do just that. Smartin's goal is to be your centralized content hub. Our advanced technology has the ability to connect to the source of all of your content repositories, whether it's product, marketing, help centers or support systems. And it centralizes everything into the translation cloud where it can be accessed by professional language service providers such as Smartling Language Services, who can deliver high quality translations and transcreations. And we automate much of that translation process through APIs, connector integrations, and our translation web proxy, the Global Delivery Network. You can use our translation management system to manage every step of the way, from workflows to linguistic assets to people and much more. To learn all about how Smartling can help you reach your global audience, head over to smartling.com. Now, the agenda for today is discussing the development, translation, and implementation of a multilingual COVID-19 glossary, which was led by Holly. Now, Holly, before we dive in, let's go back to the very beginning of this project, or even before it all started. Can you share with us the aha moment in realizing that a glossary was needed? Um, I suppose, what was the starting point and really why was this developed? Yeah, thank you, Rachel. And so, as Rachel's mentioned, I have a, a research interest and background in looking at immunisation, acceptance and uptake. And certainly through this pandemic, we've heard a lot about hesitancy, this issue where people may be uncertain or unwilling to receive the COVID vaccine. And, and for some people, that may be a new term that you haven't necessarily come across. Um, but for me in, in this research area, you know, of course, it is something that we have been focused on for many, many years. And we understand through the, the surveys we've done and the interviews and the other data collection processes that there is gaps in vaccine uptake, um, you know, across the world uh, and within countries. And these gaps may be within um, our childhood programs. So we, the vaccines that we may give to our kids, it may be in our adolescent programs and certainly also in our adult vaccine programs. And this, this, these gaps may be occurring for a, a range of reasons, including what people think and how they feel about vaccines vaccines, um, you know, whether or not they perceive the, the disease as, as being severe, or if they think they feel um, at risk of infection. Uh, but it can also occur because of issues around access. And so we've been tracking gaps in vaccine uh, uptake, certainly here in Australia, uh, occurring in a range of different groups. And, and one particular group we were focused on were people who were migrants to the country or those who came to Australia as refugees. 
And this population group uh, is quite diverse. Here in Australia, they speak over 300 plus languages. And so we have you know, cultural groups from all around the world who have come to, to live now here in Australia. But the same can be said for many countries around the world, including Canada, uh, the UK, parts of Europe and the US, of course. Um, and it's that diversity that we value within our communities. But it also means that sometimes, and, and especially around healthcare and uh, accessing different health interventions, that we see issues coming up and, and a lot of this comes down to literacy, health literacy, and the capacity to, to navigate um, information about, um, you know, different recommendations. And it was that aha moment that we saw during the pandemic, you know, back in 2020 last year, where we were starting to have these concerns raised that we would see a gap in vaccine uptake between those who are born in Australia and those who migrated to Australia. And certainly those gaps were being reported with other pandemic related behaviours in other parts of the world. And so that concern started to emerge that we certainly did, what, did not want to see disparity in our vaccine coverage for COVID. And so we, 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 we thought there was, you know, there was something that we needed to, um, to be done about this. And, uh, and I'm not sure whether my first thoughts were to go to a glossary, but um, this is where we ended up landing on. Amazing. And so has the glossary played a success in the uptake with those different migrant groups, would you say? Look, it's, it's many different facets that support vaccine coverage and vaccine acceptance. And certainly when we, we look at those elements, we can classify them into a, different, a few different um, areas. Um, and so, you know, just from these stats here, you can see that we've done really, really well here in Australia um, with our vaccine coverage now. And certainly where I live here in Sydney and in the state of New South Wales, we are just about to hit, I think, 94% first dose. Um, and, and we're doing really well with our, with our second dose coverage too. But that certainly, um, there are pockets across Australia where there is lower levels of uptake and certainly there is, when we look beyond our borders of Australia into the region of, of the Asia Pacific, or certainly into other areas. And, and I think there's a lot of concern at the moment about vaccine coverage in places like Africa, in across different countries in Africa that, uh, you know, we, we are still got a, a long way to go with, with getting people vaccinated. And a lot of that is to do with access, actually being able to get into a clinic and being able to, to get a vaccine. But also we've got to be mindful that in order for someone to, to accept a vaccine, they need to feel that they understand the, the rationale for getting vaccinated. They need to understand the, the disease that they're trying to protect themselves from, understand you know, how does it transmit, you know, why are we needing vaccines when there's been a lot of emphasis around the use of masks and there's been a lot of emphasis around the use of, of washing your hands during this pandemic. And, and so why are we talking about, um, you know, why are we talking about vaccines now? But beyond those kind of understanding elements, we also have to have confidence. So we have to have confidence in the development process. We have to have confidence in the, the providers that are, that are providing the vaccine or, or the government that's making the, the decisions around the vaccine. But we also need to feel motivated too, that we're going to go out there and, and do this. And again, motivation comes down to, you know, understanding our risk of, of the disease. And, and I'll use COVID here, but this certainly could be relevant to, to a range of other um, diseases, of course, that we promote immunisation for. But, you know, to have understanding, to, to have motivation and, and to feel confident, 
you need to engage with the, the information that's out there. And you need to be able to, to understand, you know, what's being said to you, whether it is over the television, whether it's on the radio, whether it's coming via, you know, the, the local media, the print, the, pres, the print media, or whether it's information on websites. You know, we need to be able to, to actually process through this information and be able to, to understand, you know, and, and, in, and, and make it um, real for us, make it, you know, make it um, relevant to our situation. So on this slide here, what you can see is, is kind of the, the model construct that has been developed by the World Health Organization. And it's really talking through all of those elements that I've just been mentioning. How do we lead someone from potentially being vaccine hesitant or just, you know, maybe sitting on the fence around the vaccine, just not entirely sure whether or not getting vaccinated is for them? So how do we build their confidence? How do we, you know, nudge them to, to realise that they are, you know, that they are risk and that they have the option of receiving a vaccine that has been tested now worldwide um, and has been shown to be safe and effective in reducing severe disease? How do we get them to, to, to be doing this? And so... This is really kind of the underpinnings of what we've been trying to do to promote and support vaccine uh, acceptance here in Australia. And the groups that I've been particularly focused on are uh, this kind of group that we define as culturally and linguistically diverse. Um, so this includes people who are, have uh, a multicultural um, background, uh, a different ethnicity, uh, maybe have a, a come with a, a different language. Uh, we wanted to ensure that we were, we were supporting this group. I'll move to the next slide now. Yeah, so we'll talk through the, the nuts and bolts of how this glossary was developed, please. Thanks, Ali. So when we when we go back to that aha moment, yeah. what we were doing at the time was doing um, in-depth interviews with, uh, I'll go, no, go back a few slides, yeah. in-depth interviews with uh, key stakeholders um, across Australia. And this kind of idea kept coming up in these interviews that we were that there were people out there struggling to to talk COVID, that they were you know that they were being put into a position where they would need to to go out into the community and to actually you know have maybe one on one conversations with different community members out there. And these community members may be, uh, you know, people that they were seeing uh, as part of maybe um, uh, services around uh, settlements, um, around, you know, moving to Australia, you know, getting support by local community organisations. We had community leaders and faith-based leaders, you know, coming to us and saying, well, you know, COVID comes with a lot of jargon. You know, how do I actually break down this jargon to actually, you know, have a conversation with someone? And it is that really, that message about helping people to speak COVID, to understand and to be able to, to put things into to lay terms that made us and, and spurred us on to developing this glossary. And so once we got it into our mind that we wanted to have a tool that we could give uh, people in the community, including those uh, maybe who don't necessarily have a health background, but who have the opportunity to, to reach into different communities in ways that maybe government doesn't have. And, and this includes, as I said, community leaders, faith-based leaders, uh, you know, different uh, youth leaders, um, people who, who work in, in multicultural health, who, who but, but even those who are supporting people with low literacy or health literacy levels. You know, how do we support those people? We needed to give them some sort of tool that they could go back to. 
So we settled on the glossary and we had seen that there were other glossaries out there, certainly for um, vaccination in general. So we weren't, you know, we weren't creating the wheel here. We knew that there were, you know, templates that we could, we could look at. The challenge is when we looked at uh, past examples of glossaries is that we found that many of them included the more technical definition, but they didn't necessarily include the more simplified version. And that was what we were trying to, to get to. We were trying to get to uh, a definition of a, a, a medical term that someone would feel uh, happy to, to use in their everyday language. So you didn't need to have a medical background to feel comfortable and confident to, to use this, this particular term. So when we, we settled on this glossary, we identified that we needed it to focus on the um, development of the COVID vaccines. We needed it to, to, to focus on the, the delivery of these vaccines and it needed to also focus on the safety element. So I think if we skip to the next slide, I think you will see now that we ended up having quite a diverse team when it came to actually the development process. Because we were in, because we were dealing with uh, medical and vaccine and immunization terminology, we really needed to make sure that any of the technical terms that we simplified stayed true to the meaning, that we didn't, uh, you know, stray too far from, you know, what is mRNA? You know, what is efficacy? What is, uh, you know, a variant? You know, these terms have, have crept into our vocabulary, but may we may not necessarily truly understand them. And certainly what we were seeing in the, in the print media and in the, in the mass media was a lot of, um, you know, confusion or kind of, interchanging of these terms and you know certainly maybe people don't think that that's a that's a big issue but you know it, it there it is important that we have consistency in how we approach the the definitions because of the issue of misinformation you know throughout this pandemic you know misinformation has been you know undermining our pandemic activities. And it has caused confusion, it has caused uh, changes in trust levels. And, and, and unfortunately, we've even been able to link um, misinformation to deaths around the world. And so it was really important that we wanted to make sure that the, the terms were, were correct, um, and that they could be consistently used, um, you know, with, with different sectors. And so we pulled on a range of different people who worked in immunisation, including those who worked in uh, the kind of the more lab-based basic science settings, people involved with the development of vaccines, all the way through to people who were involved with the, the policy kind of program development implementation side of things. And, and we had people from our National Immunization Center. We also had those who, who sit on our technical advisory group. So people really who every day are talking about immunization. They, they live and breathe immunization. But that certainly wasn't enough. We needed to, to match those people in with the people then who, whose everyday job is to focus on supporting health literacy, who, you know, have a past history in actually taking, uh, you know, technical um, uh, websites or taking technical resources and trying to simplify them down to the reading level that we were trying to reach. And that was a level eight, which is the, the recommended reading level for people who may have low health literacy um, levels. And so that is when we, we really called on those who, who work in, in health literacy, 
but also those who work in, in community settings, multicultural health settings, and most importantly, those who, who work every day as, as translators. And it is probably the, the translators um, and people who work in, in, in translating, interpreting services who probably gave me the hardest time in the development of the glossary because they kept coming back to me and saying, Holly, this just doesn't feel right. This doesn't sound right. When I try to, 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 to use this phrasing or to use this language, this word isn't, you know, isn't working. You know, what does it mean? And, and here you can see some of the, my favorite terms that we went backwards and forwards on in trying to, to land on some sort of uh, term or, or simplified version that we felt would be, would be acceptable. Um, and so, you know, that was when probably I received 20 different versions of the same term and you know, try to, to bring together everybody's great feedback uh, in a way then that would, would be satisfactory to those in the immunization sector, but also satisfactory to those who were, you know, really grilling me on the, on the health literacy side of things. And so I value the time that really colleagues gave for free in, in putting, you know, putting forward these, these um, you know, updates and, 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 and corrections to me. And, and that was wonderful. People came from all across Australia to, to certainly to help and to keep me on track with, um, with developing this tool. So this was really just focused on the process of taking the term to the, the technical term and to then going through the process of landing in a simplified version. So Rachel, I think if we look at the next slide, Yes. Here we can see some examples. So this is this is what we landed on. I put a call out to uh, experts around Australia. I put a call out to experts around the world via social media to say, you know, send me any term that you think we might be using during this pandemic as part of the implementation of this COVID vaccine vaccines program. And certainly, I you know. These, some of these terms are what we normally see with immunization, um, but we had a lot of COVID specific terms too. And you can see from the, the column that we've got where it says definition. So that's the technical definition that, you know, if you were to look at, uh, you know, a, a website from the, the, the United States CDC or from, you know, another uh, in, uh, infectious disease agency, you know, that, that would be the technical term that they would have. And then we tried to take that to a point where it would be something we would be comfortable in using in our in our in our in our speech in our, in our online resources in our print resources, um, something that would help with, you know, supporting the understanding of the person who's who's trying to communicate because that's important also, but also trying to to support consistency in the resources that we developed. Um, and, and to make sure that those resources were, were done in a way that would be acceptable and useful to people with low literacy, low health literacy levels. So this is, this is certainly what we did. So from A to Z, we went through all of these different terms um, and we, we ended up with a simplified version, but that was only half of the, the picture. Then we had to get to the translation side. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's only half the battle and you've already done so much. Did you get much of an uptake on the, the call outs on social media for, for term suggestions? Yeah, look, people were great in terms of, you know, not, I suppose it was a, a space of, you know, seeing the terms and feeling reassured that we'd covered most of the or most of the relevant terms uh, but also 
you know, yes, certainly getting some some new ones that we hadn't landed on before. And, you know, just like this pandemic continues to throw curveballs at us, we acknowledge that, you know, these these terminologies, um, you know, that there, there continues to be new words added to our vocabulary. And so this has been, um, you know, a, a, a continued work that we need to, you know, we'll, we'll continue to go back and, and reflect on, on the words that are used. But, you know, many of these terms, you could look at this glossary and use it to support, you know, the, 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 the communication about immunization for any of the vaccines that we yeah. recommend anywhere around the world. The, for many of these terms, they are universal, um, universal terms that are, that are relevant. And, and this is what, you know, we need to start doing, um, you know, within, you know, all different sectors, not only health sectors, but, you know, any, any workplace, any uh, school or university sector, um, any community sector that is trying to support vaccine uptake to to your to your employers, employees, into the people that you interact with in your networks. You know, we need to start making sure that we use more simplified language within our within our terms. This isn't about dumbing down things. This isn't about suggesting people don't have the comprehension to to to, to go through this. But you know, a lot of this jargon you know, even for people working within the sector, you know, I've seen health experts still land on the wrong term sometimes. And so we all need, you know, once in a while, just to go back and refresh our own understanding. And, um, you know, when having conversations with people who work outside health, you know, we don't need to take these technical terms and, and try and apply them because it doesn't feel authentic. You know, we need to, to use language and phrasing that we feel comfortable and confident using it. And this is what we've tried to do. If I move on to the next slide, yeah. I think this takes us then on to the translation yeah. side of things. Yeah, so when it came to choosing the languages to translate into Holly, how did you and your team decide? Yeah, Rachel, thank you. That's a really good question. And certainly something that we've been grappling with throughout these, um, throughout the pandemic. And so you can see from this list, the, the, the languages that we have ended up translating to. So of course, this is a product that has originated out of Australia. So with this, you know, many of these languages, of course, are, are relevant to the, the migrant groups that we have in Australia, and certainly, to to you can see there, there's a variation there. Some of these um, languages are linked to some of our bigger um, uh, migrant groups, including we've got large populations of of Chinese migrants, people who've come from Italy and Greece uh, and uh, Portugal, um, and you know, uh, you know, beyond that, then on Thailand, you know. Beyond that, then we've got the languages that uh, link to our kind of more newly emerging communities. And so community groups that may not have um, such established support networks around them. And, you know, to kind of go back to this point I was talking about earlier, we were doing, you know, over the last six months, in-depth interviews as part of a, a program of research uh, and these interviews were with people who support uh, migrants and, and refugees here in Australia, our multicultural sectors. And these stakeholders were working in government and non-government and, and community-led organisations. And these interviews were eye-opening. They really were a chance to get a sense of what was working and what wasn't working so well when it comes to communication and engagement during a pandemic. And, and not just about supporting the vaccine rollout, but also about, you know, how do we, uh, how do we support people to, to receive the, the vaccine? And how do we support people to go and get tested? And, um, understand you know when they um you know when they need to 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 isolate and when they need to quarantine 
So these were, you know, these these interviews really helped shape kind of our understanding about, you know, which uh, communities, um, you know, probably needed enhanced support. And certainly, you know, we kept hearing this kind of common denominator come through that it's the, the community groups that don't necessarily have, you know, large community organisations supporting them or may not have, uh, you know, ethnic radio or ethnic newspapers um, or don't necessarily have large numbers of people within, you know, the different states and territories here in Australia uh, that kind of can come together for, for meetings. And so that is why we, we certainly wanted to, to include, uh, you know, languages that would, would, would help you know, support those um, those people, and so this is why you can see there is certainly a mix of of languages here in this um in this list, and certainly you know I I, I acknowledge um, that the work that my colleagues did in in reaching out to the different sectors, the different communities, to make sure that we had landed on the correct. Um, Groups. And so I acknowledge my, my colleague, Lisa Woodland, from the New South Wales Multicultural Health Communication Unit, uh, who did a wonderful thing in kind of taking the, the glossary off my hands and, and really guiding it through this next phase. And she really has, um, you know, many, many years of expertise in, in working with local communities to, 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 to develop tailored resources that um, you know are relevant to to the to the communities of, of focus and really this process of the the translation was very much an eye-opener to to me because my background wasn't in translation and certainly I'd you know I'd been hearing a lot about you know the 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 processes of translation but, you know, I suppose somewhat in my own naivety, you know, we talk about, oh, it's important to have um, documents translated and to have, you know, health providers working with interpreters. But actually the, 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 the process of that, you know, for me and, and I think for other colleagues working within the immunisation sector, probably we've never really delved into you know, how does that process operate? And what are the best practice principles with trying to get uh, a, a resource um, translated? And so I very much welcomed the opportunity to go with Lisa on this journey to actually look at, you know, what, what was the next steps. And with her, you know, with her guidance, we landed on a three-step process for, for actually translating this document. So each of the, each of the, uh, the, so the glossary was yeah. actually looked at by three different translators uh, for each language. And so we had two translators who were certified by our national translation authority. And they both had a go of, of translating it and comparing notes and 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 kind of coming to a to a consensus on this um, on on the document, and then it was also then looked at by a third party who is responsible for uh, translations of documents at a more district level here in, in in Sydney, and so three sets of eyes looked at each of these these language groups and did this under immense uh, pressure, time pressure, uh, you know, operating within a pandemic setting. You know, we were conscious that the, the start of the vaccine program was imminent and we wanted to have this glossary available uh, within, you know, a timely way so that people could, could start to, to use it when they were supporting communication around this, um, this, these new vaccines coming. Uh, and so we needed to get this done. And, you know, at the same time, the, these, these translators in these, in these units were also having to, to translate all of the other pandemic 
uh, resources and and government official notices, you know, day in, day out. And so my hat goes out to all of the people who have had some sort of role in translation during the pandemic, because, you know, certainly I've been hearing a lot about, you know, the time pressures and, and you know, the, the need to kind of work in, in situations which are possibly not optimal, possibly not ideal, um, and, 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 you know, under a lot of scrutiny. I'm not sure how, you know, other settings, you know, Rachel, you may be able to, to comment on the Irish setting, but, you know, here in Australia, there was a lot of scrutiny about the the communication messaging going out. So whether that be the, the government's website or the, the websites of local governments or the, the, the mass media TV advertisements, you know, every time something new came up, it was all across our, um, our newspapers and, and, and it was getting a lot of um, commentary via kind of different you know, different um, opinion leaders around Australia. And so, you know, there was a lot of scrutiny on these on these products and we wanted to make sure that um, that it was right and, and, and that we'd landed on something that, you know, would, would be able to hold up if, if someone, if it came to the, if it came to the crunch. Yeah, well, it just goes to show with the level of expertise that you've you've assembled for this collaboration between everybody that you worked with from research to the translation process on having, you know, three sets of eyes per language, per term, per definition. You know, it really just goes to show you the level of care and due diligence you've you've given to this and how much of a credible source of truth it can be um, and it can be used by anybody really. When you talk about the differences between, um, you know, the terminology and, and, you know, simplifying those definitions down and really trying to get the wording correct, as you mentioned, it's not about dumbing it down. It's about, you know, accessibility and breaking down any barriers on this very important issue. Were any additional resources considered for the linguists, such as, you know, images or additional documentation that they can, I suppose, maybe refer to to kind of really hone in on what exactly they're going to be, how they're going to translate the, the terms? Yeah, look, that is a, that's a really good point. And, and again, you know, if if we were doing this outside of a pandemic, you know, probably what we would land on is a, a you know a reference group that we would have you know opportunity to to go back to and 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 continue that kind of dialogue backwards and forwards to come to a kind of you know the the, the consensus around you know each of the different um each of the different terms and how they mean and 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 also get you know a range of different eyes looking at them and you know and, and unfortunately that is you know where you know we landed on this in the middle of a pandemic and so it is the reality of trying to work to those pressures um, and having you know budget stretched and resources stretched and people stretched that you know you've you've kind of you know you've you've got to, to there, there is a little bit of give and take there and and so you know I think that is where you know certainly we've been open to feedback and we've been receiving that feedback which has been which has been great to you know people um, you know out there in the community who we certainly didn't necessarily have any sort of contact with um, prior to, to launching the glossary you know have have cold called us to say look you know thank you so much you know it's great to, to have this resource um, you know I've I've come at this with a slightly different um, set of eyes and you know did you consider changing the the the, the phrasing to mean this and you know again we've kind of gone back to acknowledge that, you know, in this setting, you know, people will have, uh, you know, there, there will always be variations in, in how we do these translations. And, and, and so it is that balance. It is um, making sure that we have tools out there to support vaccine 
provision and 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 uptake in a, in a timely way, but also tools that people feel you know are you know are are relevant to them. And so you know that that has been a certainly a hard space to just keep that that balance between the um between the two groups and and not wanting to leave uh, any community. Um, behind and 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 Rachel actually one story that um you know one really good story that came out of the the launch of this glossary was actually I was contacted by a, a colleague working in Nepal and they actually um, reached out and said you know could they have permission to take the the simplified English version and and to to tailor it and and to translate it for use in Nepal. And so actually it has gone out all across all of the districts of Nepal in in a slightly different version than the one we have, you know, based in Australia. But, you know, to me, that was just exactly what I wanted this glossary to do. I wanted it to take flight and to be picked up by people, you know, you know, around the world to, to support, you know, you know, yes, you know, we, we've now been, you know, 10 months or so into this vaccine program for COVID, but we still got a long way to go. And we have got, um, you know, still, you know, many other groups that we're trying to to get vaccinated, including those who who remain hesitant those who who just haven't had a chance to to get there because of access issues, Um, but also potentially with this shift in, uh, you know, having, um, you know, children vaccinated for COVID too. And and, and that certainly is already happening in some sectors. So this is is going to be a, a, a living document that, you know, COVID's not over, you know, for, for some, you know, we may think, oh, you know, certainly we're net moving into the next phase of COVID and, you know, moving into a, a space where, you know, we're not seeing such huge numbers of deaths, but that's not worldwide. We've still got a long way yeah. to go. And Holly, can you tell us from research to publication, how long did this take? Oh, golly, it felt like it could have been nine months delivering a baby, but it wasn't. It was slightly less um, and it was probably a bit more um, frantic than than all of that. So I um, I think we, we, we were able to deliver it within uh, probably a one and a half months or so oh. from really kind of landing on the idea to to pushing it through some the translations occurred in a rolling way um and we 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 tried to to push up the translations as they became available but um you know certainly that um you know that was uh you know we we tried to once we got rolling we we tried to get this out as as quickly as we could and actually i think it took us longer to try and do the official launch than it was um <laughs> it was actually available on the website it was very hard to actually get a get the the official kind of health department to 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 be present and and be available right. to a uh, to launch a product in the middle of a pandemic so that's certainly also a lesson I've learned don't try and do <laughs> something uh something with any official health department person in 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 place so that takes us on to um the implementation I suppose of of the the glossary now that we have it in our hands um how was it marketed and promoted yeah, so look, that's um, you know, that's a, a great point, and 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 you know, this was a tool that was developed, you know, uh, with a lot of people power and people time and and, and dedication from those who, who really saw the value add. It wasn't actually, um, it didn't receive any funding, so we did all this off the, our own backs. Um, you know, many of these colleagues and you know myself, you know, we we work you know, and, and, and have been contributing to the, to the COVID activities in a range of different ways. Uh, but we, you know, we wanted to get this out there. So we, we delivered this product in, in a fashion without funding. Um, and so it didn't necessarily have the kind of fanfare that, of course, I would have loved it to, to have. And so we, we had to rely on the networks that we have. And, you know, 
for the target audience we originally had in mind, you know, we tapped on the kind of the, the diverse networks that we have through different um, multicultural units and, and, uh, and the health sector, you know, really trying to, to push it out then also to, to the immunisation sector. Because sometimes, of course, these two groups, um, you know, are, are quite siloed. And so we wanted to make sure that across the different areas and, and spheres that we thought it could be useful in that we were, um, you know, getting the message out there. And so we had, we did have an official launch. We were able to, to get um, a range of different people on the ground, or well, not on the ground, it was all via Zoom, of course, because mm -hmm. COVID was just ramping up here in Sydney um, for our kind of second wave. And so we all did it by Zoom, but it was lovely to have, you know, uh, people in attendance who, who really then took the message of the glossary back to their local networks and and passed it on that way and so we put it out via some social media of course too but what we've also been doing to, to support uh, this on the ground was I've been myself and, and colleagues within the kind of immunization sector have been running workshops with a, a range of different stakeholders, uh, vaccine ambassadors, uh, you know, health providers to, to really help with enhancing how we communicate around immunization around this COVID vaccine, that vaccines. And so we've been kind of doing these workshops about communicating with impact. And so again, this glossary has been a tool to kind of align with these, um, with these workshops as well, to, to give something back to people who, you know, for, for many of these people, they've been, you know, giving up their days and, you know, giving up months of, of, of their time mm -hmm. to support um, their local communities. And, and here's where I'm talking about the community leaders, the faith-based leaders who have been going door to door, you know, putting together food hampers, putting together, you know, turning up at, at, at local faith organisations, uh, you know, jumping on Zoom calls with their community members to try and pass on the message about, you know, why it's important to receive the, the COVID vaccine um, and, and what it means at a community level. And so it was for these people really that we wanted to give them, you know, an, an easy access tool that they could take with them as part of those, um, as part of those forums and, and different communication outputs. Amazing. So you've gained a lot of traction already with those efforts. Are you pleased with how it's been received so far and um, with the success of the workshops? Yeah, look, certainly we've, um, you know, we've, we've tried to do our best on, on, as I said, you know, no, no funding. It has been, you know, people's times and, and certainly that's, um, you know, we acknowledge for, for everyone around the world, you know, this is, these have been trying times and, and then, you know, certainly I, I, you know, I, I think, you know, we could have, you know, would have loved to have done more, but, you know, the reality is, and, you know, we, we have, you know, done our best to, to get it out there as much as we can. And so, you know, certainly I've, I've, you know, can reflect now on a, on a fair few challenges with trying to, to push uh, tools like this out through um, pandemic situations and, um, you know, timeliness, you know, having, you know, just trying to pull together people in a volunteer way you know you can only push people so far and and, and send them so many emails because yeah. you are calling on a lot of favors and and I certainly think I owe people a lot of coffees for for what they did for me um and so that is you know that was you know I feel that we did well in trying terms of trying to get it um, out in the timeline we did but of course you know it could have been tighter. We could have turned around things in, in shorter time. And, and, and I wish we could have done that. Um, you know, if funding had been available, uh, you know, maybe that would have made it, you know, slightly easier. And, and certainly, you know, I think for governments around the world, I think it's, and, and, and other organisations, you know, I think it is about reflecting back on, you know, what is needed during, um, you know, emergencies like this. And, you know, this infectious disease emergency isn't unique. Uh, you know, we went through a pandemic back in 2009 with the H1N1 uh, swine flu, people 
would probably remember it as a swine flu pandemic. Um, you know, pandemics for other infectious diseases, you know, maybe they're going to happen too. You know, I, I teach a course in infectious diseases and I certainly never thought within the time frame of me teaching that I would be able to use two pandemics within my teaching materials that I've lived through, um, as opposed to historical pandemics from the, the 1918s, 1919s. You know, this is these are lived experiences now to, to draw on. Um, but pandemics will occur again. That is the unfortunate truth of, of you know, the, the setting that we're in. But there are other types of emergencies where you know, having things like glossaries developed in timely ways, you know, could be useful in ensuring consistency in messaging and, and ensuring that communication materials go out there and are relevant to um, the communities that are targeted. And, you know, certainly we are you know, talking a lot at the moment about climate change. We're talking, you know, a lot about the different natural emergencies that could come through. And, and all of this is, is settings where we need to start acknowledging, you know, how do we support literacy? How do we support health literacy? How do we support what I define as, as community engagement? Ways to get dialogue going between different sectors in, 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 our, in our populations. Of course, we wanted to, to, to have uh, you know, a glossary that would be accessible, as, as make it as accessible as possible. And, and we did initially think that this glossary would be an online app. And maybe I still dream that it could become um, that maybe in, in, in time and, and maybe hopefully if it could be adopted as, a, as an ongoing strategy that, you know, a lot of people spoke to me about the ease of having something at their fingertips. You know, we're so used to, to jumping on our phones, you know, <sighs> using an app to, to look up things or to, you know, to search for things. And certainly there are other types of app-based glossaries. Um, you know, as part of the development process, I was hearing about uh, glossaries that had been uh, developed to help uh, translators in um, legal settings, uh, translators who work with national uh, disability schemes. Again, places where you want consistency in the, you, it's critical to have consistency in language. Um, and, and they've been able to get to this kind of um, app-based form. Um, so that's my, that's my goal. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly, I'm not giving up and I'd like to, I'd like to, to see what we can, we can get to. Having a reference group would be, um, would be good for this too. Um, if this is going to be, you know, and hopefully it will, you know, an ongoing process that we can reach back onto and, and make sure that we ensure that we have um, that ongoing accuracy is my next point, that we ensure that the, the terms that we are using um, are culturally sent, you know, relevant and, and, and appropriate and, um, and, and meaningful. So that's something we need to, we need to continue to, to, to work on. But all of this is hindsight and that's my solution. Hopefully it'll be a reality. I think it will be um, as we progress in this life with COVID. And will this glossary evolve as uh, this life evolves with COVID or, you know, with other um, possible pandemics, fingers crossed that doesn't happen. But, you know, reality is um, it could be. Every 30 years, maybe. Yeah. When we teach, we say there's a pandemic every 30 years, but uh, things are starting to speed up on yeah. <laughs> that time frame. Look, we it, this is this is certainly a tool that you know could be adapted as I as I mentioned to to supporting our national immunization programs, supporting vaccine uptake for uh, you know other um, diseases that are vaccine preventable and and you know, look, we, we can look at, you know, we have a range of, of vaccines that we promote in, in different settings, including those for travel, including those for occupational risk, uh, including those to, to, to reduce the, the, the risk for, for, for people who may be vulnerable because of other reasons. And we still have lots of gaps, lots of 
you know, lots of activity to try and, and, and improve um, uptake and acceptance. And, and, you know, looking at the horizon now, certainly with the um, development of this kind of mRNA-based technology, you know, people are starting to talk about vaccines for, for diseases that maybe we originally thought would never be vaccine preventable. And, and, you know, certainly, you know, have, you know, fingers crossed that one day we'll see a vaccine for things like HIV. But, you know, beyond that, of course, the potential for, for reducing the, the burden of disease from things like cancer via vaccination. And again, with every sort of new advent of, of or a new kind of direction in, in different technologies that are used, it will mean that people will question it. People will have those uncertainties. And exactly what we've seen with the the use of some of the, the COVID-19 vaccines where people will say, oh, well, hang on, this doesn't seem right. You know, this doesn't sound right. I, I don't trust it. And this then, you know, is where we see misinformation. So if I can have a glossary out there supporting yeah. all of the new vaccines that we, we have, you know, certainly that would be my, um, my goal. Amazing. And then if we were to get a little bit technical and for anybody joining us today that are interested in implementing this glossary, how would one go about it? Yeah. So, you know, certainly, you know, I've been talking about some of the focus groups that I've been working with to develop and, and so to, to utilise this, um, this glossary, but certainly this is not a, a limited space. When we say, when we talk about um, immunisation, we certainly encourage anyone to be a vaccine ambassador. And so, of course, traditionally, our healthcare workers play a key role in promoting vaccine uptake. But, you know, I think this, this COVID pandemic has um, reminded us that, you know, for some communities, you know, they may not necessarily go and see a, a, a provider or they may need a, a nudge to, to go in and, and to start thinking about immunisation. And so, you know, right now we've got workplaces, we've got community settings, we've got, you know, hospitals, schools, universities, we've got, you know, sports groups, we've got, you know, people talking to family and friends about immunisation. So th these conversations are happening, you know, in, in a range of different ways. And to have a, a, a conversation that may lead to someone actually starting on a journey of, of going to consider immunisation, as I said, it comes back to these key elements. It's about building confidence, it's about building skills, and it's about building uh, their, their understanding. And to be able to do that, we ourselves, as the person may be communicating, we also need to feel confident and, and comfortable in what we're saying. And, and if we do that and we actually ourselves understand these technical terms, we will then communicate with more confidence and what we're saying will be trusted. And so if you are uh, a business owner, if you are, you know, working in a, in a sector where, you know, you have people interacting with each other who may be at risk, you know, you're going to be having some, some challenging conversations. And this is where this glossary could come into play. So it is about building your own skills, but also then making sure that the materials that you put out to your communities, to your workplaces, to your staff, um, then reflect accurate information and, and information that's going to be to be understood and accepted. Yeah, and it's so important, um, as we've already mentioned, having a credible source of truth in all of this is vital. And as we evolve in this life, it's great to have a resource that's there, ready to hand um, and ready uh, to be used by any business owner or anyone who's responsible for a group of people. Um, and so if anybody was to avail of your glossary, Holly, how would one go about it? Yes, yeah, certainly, Rachel. They're, they're, I'm very willing to, to receive emails or questions or comments or um, that you may have. So please reach out to me. Uh, I'm based at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, and you can reach me via my email um, address there. Um, alternatively, you can find me on Twitter, and I'm also via LinkedIn. So 
plenty of ways to, to reach out and, and to, to open up the communication lines. If you, if you have questions around how to communicate with impact and how to use this glossary to, to support vaccine acceptance and uptake. Amazing. Thank you so much, Holly. We're actually just about up on time, um, but if you wouldn't mind, we have a couple of questions coming in, um, if you wouldn't mind answering them before we yeah, start. Certainly. Brilliant. So one question here is, it seems as though Hungarian is still missing from the glossary, and from what I know, there are a lot of Hungarian people in Australia. Are there any plans to expand the glossary to cover more languages? Oh, look, this has been something that we keep receiving great emails from translators in the community saying, look, you know, I will take the time. And so the challenge here is, again, making sure that quality check is there, that it is about not just having that one person, but having that three point check. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we we will need to regroup and and you know, this is this is where our you know our funding limits come in and and, and really impact us as here. So, you know, certainly we are open to dialogue and and we're exploring a, a range of different ways to to try and expand on on the languages that we have. Amazing, yeah. So more languages to come for sure. And what did you learn throughout the process? I suppose this is your first time dealing with localization and translation. So I'd say that was interesting for you. It was a whole new, to talk about languages, it was a whole new language for me. It was certainly something where, you know, we we, we understood the the need and certainly spoke about, you know, the need to, to, to work with, uh, you know, and, and have translated materials, but also to work closely with interpreters when trying to, to have conversations around immunisation. But, you know, I, I certainly, you know, in, in all of the training that I've received around immunisation, no one has ever really taken me through those kind of steps that it, that that are needed to be done and and to really you know to talk to me about you know the the challenges and and the elements that we really need to to spend more time and in understanding it and 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 how do we build those relationships between the different sectors to make sure that we are working more closely together in um you know in, in doing in doing this um beyond pandemics you know and and that's um all of that i think we're going to be writing a whole paper and um on on the challenges of of translation and interpretation during the pandemic and so okay. watch this space i'll um, i'll make sure I, I get it out there and make it available your next venture is unfolding um okay and the last question for anybody joining us today that are even thinking about embarking on the the journey of glossary development what advice have you got yeah look i think it is certainly you know making sure those links are there with the, the relevant stakeholders and you know working you know with my colleagues from the multicultural health communication unit was was critical because you know really they they did guide me through that that translation process and you know we 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 had you know access to, to to online tools to check the the readability scores again to make this um you know easy as as possible to to land on a product that was um that was appropriate but but also to be humble and to to accept that you know goodness you you know sometimes you just don't hit the mark and uh, and you need to you need to take it back to the drawing board and you need to to flesh it out again and 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 sometimes it it is just about you know looking at you know just scrapping the whole thing and starting again with um with some of your uh, some of your attempts and and that is where you know working with with a range of people i i valued their their input in a way that um you know it, it, i don't think i would have got here without having you know a range of different eyes on this um on this project yeah it was a fantastic document and thank you so much for sharing your experience on how it was developed and distributed and joining us today from from sydney so thank you so much and thank you to everyone who joined us as well and holly we really wish you the best of luck in the next stages of this glossary thank you rachel and thank you to smartling for the the opportunity to speak um, at this uh, this webinar thank you.